And Michael seemed pleased, but he wanted Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I auditioned for it again when the California company came up, the road company, and they wanted to send me to California. And of course, I wanted to stay in New York, so I didn't go to California. And then uh, I was in London, and I got a call from my agent, and Michael Bennett had called again, and he wanted me to come do it on Broadway. How did you find him to work with as a director? He's a genius. He is a genius. I love watching him because he can do each one of those characters. He knows exactly mm -hmm. what he wants and exactly what they're about, and he can show you. I mean, more than just to sit down and tell you what to do. He'll get up and put his arm around you and walk right with you and show you what to do. How much creative freedom does he allow you? Because I know with a chorus line, it seems each production that you see, no matter where it is, it seems to be a carbon copy of the original. Does he allow much room for personal expression? Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't know much about a chorus line, but I know as far as Dream Girls is concerned, he deals with each individual mm -hmm. and their interpretation of the character. There are certain things that are set. There are certain things that you have to do, you know, whether you like it or not. But there's enough freedom to make up for the things that uh, are just set the way that they are. And he, as far as singing is concerned, I didn't have any strict rules. They didn't give me any strict rules about the singing. They let me pretty much sing like I wanted to. Uh, the acting, he would tell you basically what he wanted and then allow you to interpret it for yourself. How do you approach the role of Effie as an actress? Because it seems that from the book standpoint she seems to be a woman that's propelled by anger and frustration and it's up to the actress to make her sympathetic. From the book standpoint, she's also kind of self-destructive. Mm -hmm. um, there's a certain amount of strength there that is necessary because of the difference in her size and her demeanor and the way that she carries herself. Uh, Effie's very strong, but she's very weak. She's like a walking contradiction of herself. There are moments when there are certain things that are required of her, and in order for her to disagree with something, she has to go all the way out with it. She can't just say, no, I don't want to do that. She has to go all the way to the other end to get attention. And most of the time during the show, that's what she's trying to get is attention. But it seems she's a very brilliant performer within her own right. And I'm just wondering, because when you have, well, certainly, as you know, Billie Holiday was very self-destructive, yeah. and Edith Piaf was very self-destructive. Do you think that's a trait in performers who have that that light from God, so to speak? No, not necessarily. I'm not self-destructive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not really. Uh, it's, it's an unfortunate thing. It's like I've always felt that you can't have everything. I used to feel that I couldn't have a career and a personal life, um, a marriage or whatever else mm -hmm. it took. But, um, and it's only because both of them require all 
but then I found out that there is a way to be two separate people. And to go all of us right to the career and all of the other ways to come. But how were you able to come to that? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, in separating the two people, knowing that there were two people, I think, was the biggest thing in realizing it without thinking that you're schizoid. There is just two different people. There is a person on stage who enjoys what she does, loves what she does, and does it to the best of her ability and tries to please anybody. And then there is the other person in private life who is very quiet and laid back and wants to be pleased sometimes. And I just uh, discovered that there were two characters, and then I separated the two, and just tried to identify which one. Because there's a wonderful line that I think is like saying that she has a son and her son loves poetry. Daughter, a little girl. A daughter. I'm sorry, uh, but you have a son. Yes. And uh, what sort of compromises have you had to make as a performing mother? Well, uh, just before I came to New York, I was on the road for about a year and a half, and my son wasn't with me. And when I came to New York, I wasn't sure that unsettled feeling of where you're going to live and what you're mm -hmm. going to do, knowing that the opportunity was here and coming from Detroit and my baby being back in Detroit and not really knowing what I was going to do. But the sacrifice that I had to make was to leave him there until I came here and found out what I was going to do that would be better for me and him. And uh, just not being with them enough, I guess, is the biggest sacrifice that you have to deal with. Now he's older and it's easier because he's more independent and he understands. Mm -hmm. But when they're little, it's another kind of feeling. But he did pull me through a lot. I mean, he's the main person that can put his hand on me and I'll stop. I think that children's child attitude is very comfortable. Uh, we had a three-foot size. <laughs> 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 much quicker than I did. I came in here for 10 weeks and I ran back out because it was just too fast, and too busy, and too impatient, and it scared me to death. When I brought him here, he liked it, uh -huh. and he just melted right in. <laughs> so you were raised in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you start singing? That, that brings back a little story of trying to take piano lessons after I came to New York. I got so <laughs> frustrated because I never remembered learning anything from scratch. Mm -hmm. I don't remember learning how to sing. I just remember singing. Mm -hmm. It just happened. I've been singing all my life, as long as I can remember back. And uh, I entered a talent show when I was about 16 years old, and I won, and that was the beginning. Right, that was with the Dell Cabots. You know about the Del Cavets. I try and do my homework. That was the Del Cavets, yeah. My two cousins and myself, they danced mm -hmm. and I sang. Now you won $500 from this? You know everything, yeah. <laughs> we won $500 and a record contract with Motown. Motown. Right. <laughs> I have to ask you to check your notes and tell me what I'm talking about. We won a record contract with Motown, which we turned down because we were all 16 years old, still in high school, and had no idea what we were doing and didn't even know we were serious. We entered the contest because we thought we were cute mm -hmm. and we were going to get up and sing a little bit and dance a little bit and just have a little fun and it so happened we won. And um, I was the only one that went on from there mm -hmm. and stayed in music. But did, uh, did the other, your cousins ever regret turning the contract down or was it just something that you had all decided would be the best thing? None of us really regretted it. We didn't decide it. Our parents decided uh -huh. it, but it was a good decision. Mm -hmm. It was a good decision because we were too young and we weren't even dedicated to what we were doing yet. It wasn't really serious. And then I went on to perform at, uh, well, I met a gentleman who was managing me then, and I went on to perform at the 20 Grand with uh, a lot of the top mm -hmm. acts that came in, male acts. And I just did that on and on for years, and then I went with a group called Riot, and I worked with them for years, and we traveled a little bit. And um, then I went back from whence I came, after Riot had um, grown as far as local, the local groups would be the number mm -hmm. one group in Detroit. And we stretched out and worked all the best clubs, and something was missing, and I went back to a lot of the clubs that I started in. And I just hung out there for a while and just sang. And then uh, Ain't Miss Behaving came to Detroit 
and I auditioned and I came to New York and it's, it's truly a Cinderella story. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what was going to happen. I went to the audition because somebody suggested it. Now according to my notes, uh, you had never heard of Ain't Misbehaving. I get a little embarrassed about that. <laughs> I hadn't. I hadn't given. It's so cold because so many kids here in New York, I found, study and work so mm -hmm. hard to get on Broadway. I hadn't given Broadway a second thought. I was very comfortable in my clubs. I was fine. I was having a good time. I was enjoying my life, and I hadn't given it a second thought. Well, you shouldn't be embarrassed because I think most singers out of Detroit would never pick my funny Valentine to sing. <laughs> So I'm sure that redeems you. Could you tell us a little about the audition? Yeah. Shelton was at the audition. <laughs> Shelton Beckton was a musical director and uh, musical conductor in the show. And uh, I went in the audition. <laughs> I was working at a club, and I grabbed my piano player one night, and I said, uh, after the show, and I said, come on, we're going over to your house. You're going to teach me these songs so I can go do this audition. So I went over his house and we learned My Funny Valentine and a song called Close Your Eyes. I had went down to Grinnell's and picked up a little mm -hmm. book from the 30s or 40s. And we went and learned these songs and we, I sang them a couple of times. And then I got up at 10 o'clock that morning, which is taboo to a nightclub <laughs> singer in Detroit. And I went blindly into the audition and there were like, I think about 50, 60 girls there mm -hmm. and nobody wanted to go first and I was dead tired and I wanted to do it and go home so I went first and I did the audition and I remember Shelton sitting in the back saying excuse me can we hear more <laughs> <laughs> so I sang two songs and um, I left mm -hmm. and they called me about three days later and they asked me if I could travel and I said yeah so we started rehearsal I rehearsed in Detroit and we started rehearsals in Detroit, and they taught me the show. Shelton taught me the show. And uh, they sent me to New York. Mm -hmm. And you made your Broadway debut. I made my Broadway debut. How did the other cast members, being, well, I would assume, more seasoned in theater than you, because you, up until that point, had, hadn't taken any acting lessons, uh, how did they receive you as the new girl on the block? Were they very supportive, or were, was there a little bit of uh, trepidation? They were very supportive. I remember one thing that I heard uh, at the put-in rehearsal. We had a put-in rehearsal one day, and I guess the word had come before me that I mm -hmm. was coming. And I remember Alan Weeks, who is an untapped dance kid, mm -hmm. I heard, overheard Alan myself saying, if she's so fierce, why we got to rehearse? <laughs> and I came out, and... Uh, I didn't know them, I was just meeting them, and I came out and I just kind of stood there and I was a nervous wreck, I was scared to death. And we started rehearsing, and during the rehearsal, it just clicked, and we started to have so much fun. Mm -hmm. And after we got through, it was like I had known them all for years, including Alan, he's wonderful and I love him, but I guess I needed that. I needed to hear him say that because I needed to know what was going on. And it was not um, said with any animosity. It was not meant negatively. Mm -hmm. It was just the way that we talk. And after the rehearsal, it was just like I had been here forever. How did you find going out of a cabaret setting onto a Broadway stage? Strange. <laughs> Strange. I, um, I went home for uh, a little while, and I was at a club where a friend of mine was performing, a club that I used to work at, mm -hmm. and I jumped up on the stage with her, and we were cutting up and singing, and I was looking out, and I realized the actual difference of performing in such a small house, mm -hmm. as opposed when I came to New York and I walked out on the Broadway stage, I felt lost <laughs> because it was so huge. But then after a while, I got comfortable, mm -hmm. and it was okay. You had, after you had uh, started in Ain't Misbehaving, you had done your act here and certainly taken, this, of years, you know, yeah. taken this town by storm. How did you find the New York cabaret scene as opposed to Detroit? It's different. Um, in Detroit, we had a certain amount of clubs on each side of town that you frequent, and they had like their own clientele, people that came no matter who mm -hmm. was there. We would work clubs sometimes for seven months stay in the same club and all the clubs had a house band 
and the singers, the local singers in the city would just go from club to club with all these house bands and you'd go in, they always knew the top 40 and you'd just go in and do what, you know, you get together and talk and do what you both knew mm -hmm. and you just sing. Here I found that you had to put it all together yourself. You had to go hire the band and you had to get your charge drawn up. That was one of the first things I did, was got some music, got some real professional music. And you had to get your charge drawn up, and then uh, you come into the room, and you have to send out your press and get your people to come in and see mm -hmm. you, get all your friends to come down and scream so you can get in this club again. <laughs> but it, it's a big difference. Did you find it very challenging? Yes. Yes, I'm telling you, the first night I did it, and I was on stage, and I was standing there looking around, and I was saying, wow, I did all this myself. <laughs> <laughs> that certainly gives you a sense yeah, of Yeah, it does. I'm sure. It does, to look at your charts, and they're pretty, and they're real. <laughs> it is. It's a what sort of material do you look for when you're when you putting an act together? Because I know you like to uh, resuscitate some old war horses and do yeah. it your way, so to speak. I like, I like material that, um, well, like popular albums. I may buy the album, but I'll probably pick a song that doesn't get any airplay. Mm -hmm. And as far as the old war horses like My Way and Help Me Make It Through the Night and things like that, those are just things that I've always wanted to do. And they are more appreciated in New York than they would have been in Detroit. I did clubs by myself in Detroit, but you had to always shove a few of the top 40 tunes in there mm -hmm. because those people go out every weekend. And they definitely want to hear some of the stuff that they hear on the radio, something they can identify with, especially if you don't have a record. So I did a lot of that in Detroit. But when I came here, I relaxed and I realized that I could do some songs that I wanted to do all my life and just, you know, get away with it. And they were accepted well. Uh, you had met Shelton Beckton through Ain't Misbehaving, and he later became your musical director. Yeah. How did you find him to work with? I know he's gone on to work with Judy Collins. and He still works with me occasionally <laughs> <laughs> when I can snatch him away when he's not on the road. He, uh, Shelton is, gosh, I don't think there's a word to describe his musical ability. He's a perfectionist, and the one thing that I do find about him is that he keeps me on my toes. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can do a whole show, and if during the whole show, out of 15 songs, if I sing one flat note in one song, he'll remember, and he'll tell me. So he really keeps me on my toes. Well, I'm sure that's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun, though. He's great. Well, getting back to Dreamgirls, um, which does take place, I believe, in Chicago, mm -hmm. um, did you find any parallels with your, your musical education in terms of bands and groups? Do you, do you think it's an honest representation of the uh, cutthroat nature of show business? Yeah, it is. It's uh, a little sugar-coated compared to what it can actually be like. It, uh, it touches on the mm -hmm. surface of a lot of things that one has to go through to get to the top. And it can be a lot deeper than that. It's difficult. It's just pure difficult, and you have to go through a lot of different channels, and sometimes talent, most of the time, talent is not really the issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like the reason that they removed Effie to put in the new girl was for the look. It had nothing to do with Effie's talent. It was a look. Is that something that you've come up against? Because I know one critic had said, um, you know exactly what to do with everything you've got, which... I'm, I'm sure there's a growth process that you go through to become that secure in your appearance and your performing. It is. Uh, I've been a fairly large woman all my life, but I like myself. Mm -hmm. I love myself. And I believe that beauty is from within. It has nothing to do with the shell or the body that we come here in. And I think that I'm beautiful. And I have no problem with it. And uh, I treat people well, and I'm very happy, and I expect the same thing back. Mm -hmm. The confidence, I think, came in the fact of knowing that, see, there's a certain ego trip that goes with performing. Because you know that you can get people to react a certain way. You can get them to laugh. You can, you can help them laugh. You can make them cry. You can make them reminisce and feel and just go through different changes. And there's a certain little ego trip that goes with that. And that power, I would never 
misuse or disrespect. I mean, I would always care about having the ability to do something like that. And knowing that I can do that, it gives me a sense of a good feeling mm -hmm. to know that somebody can come and see me and be sitting in the audience feeling horrible and I can do something and make them laugh or make them forget just for a minute. Um, also, the confidence comes in with, from within. If you feel good about yourself, then people will feel good about you. And I think I'm a very pretty sexy lady. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly helps. As you said, you had a, a real Cinderella story, although yeah. I'm not sure whether the brothers Green would consider her sexy, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Cinderella story was a trip from Detroit mm -hmm. to New York. It right. was, because I was here within three weeks. And I mean, like I said, kids study for years. They go to the PA and different schools and, you know, drama classes and dance classes, and they do this all their life and never get on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And I slipped in because of, of a dare. Somebody dared me to go down and audition, <laughs> and I went. And I slipped right in. But how were you able to deal with that kind of success that, well, that quickly, really? All of a sudden, you're in I New York. I was too busy. I was working too hard. And also, being here and being alone, I'd never been away from my family. All my family's in Detroit. I was getting to know myself, and I had a lot of things to think about. God really picked a good time to send me here, mm -hmm. because it gave me time to sit down and really reevaluate uh, all my life and, and what I was going to do and what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be and how I wanted to do it. And it gave me things to think about and things to deal with. And as far as the success is concerned, I haven't even had time to think about that. Other things are much more important. Mm -hmm. How are you able to deal with your personal relationships? Because I know what people see on stage isn't necessarily representative of what you are off stage. Have you had a problem with that? Not, well... Yeah. You do run into a problem because there's a certain amount of loneliness that comes with this business. There's nothing you can do about it. And it's only because, <clears throat> excuse me, there are some people that think you are untouchable. Mm -hmm. And then there are those that fall in love with the illusion of what they see. And it has nothing whatsoever to do with you. They get to know you and you bore them to death. But the <laughs> illusion up there on stage is very exciting and they fall in love with the illusion. So it does call for a lot of, it, it misrepresents you a lot of times and you just kind of, wind up uh, explaining yourself or getting out of something that you probably shouldn't have gotten into in the first place. <laughs> oh, I'm sure that can be very difficult. Yeah. Oh, you have a record out now, Boy, Where Have You Been? Yes. And uh, how long have you been recording? I was recording before I came to New York. I, um, we recorded, I recorded a record with Riot, the group that I was with. Mm -hmm. I did a couple of things on my own before I came here. I did some uh, TV commercials and radio spots. And I recorded a complete album that was never released. Uh, no fault of mine, I did my part. <laughs> and, uh, Boy, Where Have You Been? I recorded and was released. And uh, there was some problem with uh, the company and moving people around. And it got lost in the shuffle, but it's still out there. I mean, I've had people tell me they've seen it in the record shop. So it's still there. And as long as it's out there, it's okay, because it puts the name out there just a little bit further. Mm -hmm. And I just keep trying until I get it right. What sort of politics go along with the music business? It seems it's probably impossible. As you say, you had an album that was recorded that was never released. Mm -hmm. is, is it a matter of packaging and marketing? Yeah. Um, a couple of the situations that I was involved with came through no fault of mine, it was in the record company when there were people being shifted and moved, like people that had a 100% interest in me mm -hmm. were moved to another department or something, and then that whole particular department just kind of let my thing go. It's a lot of politics. If you get backed by the right people and they put everything behind you and give you all of the uh, promotion and proper distribution and all of the right things, then it'll work. But if you don't get it, I mean, you can only go in and record and sit back and hope it happens. Do you find that frustrating? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't want to say I'm getting used to it. I'm not getting used to it, but I'm coming to understand a little more that these things happen. And it's mm -hmm. really, you can't put the blame on any one particular person. 
there's always the elements are always involved and different oh, things sure. happening. And business is business. And a lot of people make a lot of business decisions that they may not want to make. And they might hurt somebody, but, you know, they have to make the decisions. Well, I think the key is that it is a business. It's business. And when you're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars, and people have to account for their decisions, and they have to be careful, and they have to do what they think is right, even though it doesn't always turn out to be right for me. But they have to do what they think is right. And then I'm a firm believer in my Father God, and He makes no mistakes. Mm -hmm. So everything that is happening is for a reason. And I just, I'm very grateful that I have the mind and the intelligence to sit back and try to get some kind of logic out of it, some kind of lesson, and just understand that, you know, you just got to keep trying. How long did it take you to realize that, that if you have that perspective, it's easier to deal with things? Because I know people strive for years trying to... It took me, how old am I? 33? <laughs> it, took me, it took me 30 years to realize that to understand that you can't control the elements. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if I have faith in God, then I know that He is only going to do what's right for me. And if things don't go the way that I think they should go, then there's something else for me to learn. So I should just sit back and try to sift out what I can use and throw the rest away and learn what I can and go to the next thing. Because there's always something else. There's always something else coming up. Mm -hmm. You have a film being released in December, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, this is Cotton Club. Yeah, I'm not um, sure about that, but I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you I elaborate on that a little? Well, I was one of the Peter sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, it was myself, Amelia McQueen, and Patty Austin. And uh, we did two numbers in the movie, and we hung around the set a lot <laughs> and just enjoyed it. It was great. And even if, uh, I don't know if we're going to wind up on the cutting floor or if they're going to use it or what, but it really doesn't matter because we developed a wonderful friendship in that little time that we spent together. And if mm -hmm. that's all the movie was good for, then that's good enough for me. But uh, I hope it does come that out. I wonderful. hope I am in it. How, uh, how did you find the filmmaking process? Well, that was my first and only one. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't form a judgment. I'd have to do another one and have something to compare. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. It was educational. It was bizarre. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was fun. It was lots of fun. I got a chance to meet a lot of people. And Francis Ford Coppola was the director, and he's a genius. And watching him work was an experience. Well, that's what they say. Oh, you're getting married shortly. Yeah. I'm taking the big step. Yeah. How do you think that will uh, have a bearing on your career? Do you think you'll be able to separate the two? Yes. But he's not in show business. No. <laughs> and he's my friend. And he's been my friend for years. He's from Detroit. Mm -hmm. And we've been friends for almost nine years. So he has sort of dealt with everything that I'm going through and everything that I'm doing and he understands and there's been no problem. I don't think there will be. Well, that sounds wonderful. You've been very blessed, Roz. Yeah, I, appreciate, I am blessed. I appreciate your taking time to sit and chat today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. It's good to have you back on Broadway. Good to be back. <laughs> this is Ryan Keating and you've been watching Spotlight. Our guest today has been Roz Ryan from Dreamgirls. I'd suggest you go to the Imperial Theater and... Here is the Light Office of the Future. I'm Luke Seven Machine, Southbound.